We learned in the last video that there are a number of ways in which we can calculate the intercept and the slope for the regression model. Given this large number of options, one should ask why is least squares still the most popular way to fit these models? The answer is quite simple. The least squares objective function is very fast on computers. Because it is a differential function, it's very easy to make mathematical proofs and derive properties from it. It is also an intuitive function, easy to explain to someone who is not familiar with the process. The other forms of fitting the linear model potentially have multiple solutions. No one wants to get two different least squares answers from the same dataset. Other methods can be unstable and sometimes not converge, and the solutions, the estimates for B0 and B1, can have high variance. Mathematical proofs regarding some of these other methods are difficult to show. And lastly, there's an important statistical reason. The estimated parameters from the model, B0 for beta0 and B1 for beta1, have the lowest variance possible when certain assumptions are met. We'll see that coming up later again in this module. So I'm going to work with you next on solving the least squares model. The important point to realize is that it is actually an optimization problem that we're trying to solve, where we're aiming to minimize the sum of all the squared errors. We do this over lowercase n values of the error that we have. We have n data points, and therefore n errors. Square them, sum them up, and that's our objective that we're trying to minimize. We can vary two things in order to minimize that sum of squares of errors. The intercept estimate b0, and the slope estimate, b1. Now let's expand that equation for error. The error ei is defined as the observed value minus the predicted value. If we substitute that in here, we modify what our objective function looks like. Now I'd like to go interpret this with an example that we've looked at before. Let's go back to the gas cylinder example, where the pressure was related to the temperature using a least squares model with intercept beta0 and slope beta1. We know that beta naught is zero from theoretical principles. When the temperature is zero Kelvin, there's no pressure. Well, how can we find beta one in the context of this example of solving an optimization problem? Let me simplify the objective function here. Then you notice our only search variable remaining is B1. We're trying to estimate beta one by varying this B1 value. Well, to start off the optimization, we should have an initial guess, and we have one. We can go look at that formula and recognize that beta 1 is the number of moles of gas multiplied by the gas constant divided by the volume. And if we sub in those values, we get a number of 5.9. That's a good initial guess for solving this optimization problem. Let's go construct equally spaced points between 5 and 6.5. And then for every one of these guessed B1 values, we can go sub into the objective function over here. Let's go look at the value of that objective function as B1 changes on our evenly spaced grid. We will observe that as B1 starts out over here on the left with a low value of 5 and moves up and up, that our sum of squares of errors starts to decrease. If we keep increasing B1, however, that sum of squares of errors goes up again. We have a minimum somewhere around 5.8 and 5.9, which is pretty close to our initial guess. That's the principle of minimizing with a single variable. But a general least squares model has two variables, b0 and b1. And the same approach applies, except now we don't have a quadratic function anymore, we have a quadratic bowl shape. The minimum will be at the bottom of that bowl. You might not have taken a course in optimization, but you will recall from calculus that this objective function is what is called convex. And even if you don't remember that from your calculus course, what you should know is that a convex function will always have a minimum. And furthermore, that minimum is guaranteed to be unique and therefore a global minimum. The implication of that mathematics is that for least squares regression, the model will have only one solution. Any data set that you try and fit a least squares model for, you will only find a single value of B0 and a single value of B1 that minimizes that objective function uniquely. That's good to have. We don't ever want different values of B0 and B1 for the same data set. Now, how do computers find where that minimum is? The mathematical derivation is quite simple. We know that for a minimum, the first derivative of that function f has got to equal zero at the optimum. 
If you look at any bowl shaped function and then the slope of that function, the bottom of the bowl where that minimum occurs has a slope of zero. The plane that is tangential to the bowl is horizontal, implying a slope of zero. So what we go do then is take the partial derivative of f with respect to b0 and the partial derivative with respect to b1 and we set those equal to zero. You can readily show that you get these summation equations. These represent two equations in two unknowns. In fact, these are two linear equations in two unknowns. And right there you see why least squares is so widely used. Computers work very fast with linear equations. This set of linear equations can be solved very quickly, and in fact, you can even solve it by hand. It is not hard to prove that b0 is equal to the average y value minus b1 times the average value of x. But we need a value for b1. b1 is equal to the summation here in the numerator, x minus x bar multiplied by y minus y bar. And in the denominator, we have the sum of x minus x bar squared. Now, if something about that numerator and denominator is starting to look familiar to you, that shouldn't be a surprise. They look a lot like the variance and covariance terms you saw earlier on in this course, and we'll come back to that later on. We can also write these summations in matrix form to be a bit more compact. The matrix form for estimate B1 can be written as x minus x bar transpose times y minus y bar. And in the denominator, we have x minus x bar transpose times x minus x bar. We will also come back to the matrix form in a few videos from now. There are a number of important properties that we can derive just from these two equations. The first is that the units of b1, the slope, are equal to the units of y divided by the units of x. The other important point that we notice is, by a small rearrangement of this first equation, we can quickly prove that the least squares model always passes through the point x bar and y bar with no error. That artificial point, x bar and y bar, will lie exactly on the least squares line right in the middle of the data. The other thing that's interesting about the least squares model is that we actually don't really care what the objective function value is, the sum of squares of the errors. We never really look back at what it is numerically. But one number we are concerned about is the sum of the errors, or more specifically, the sum of the errors divided by n. In other words, what is the average error? The average error can be proved to be equal to zero. This small proof here on the screen demonstrates that. Pause the video and make sure that you can follow all the lines shown over there, especially advanced students in this course. One other final point to make is that it's quite clear that the estimate of B0 depends on the estimate of B1. Any estimation error in the slope, B1, propagates and affects the estimate of the intercept. We say that these estimates are correlated. Now one other final important property is this. Let me ask you, you've probably built many least squares models. Have you ever had the software crash when you build that model and fail to give you a result for B0 and B1? Probably never, and here's the reason for it. If you look at the formula for B0 and B1, you can see that B0 can always be calculated as long as we have a value of B1. And B1 can always be calculated as long as this denominator is not equal to zero. So what would it take for that denominator to be zero? What would your data have to look like for that situation? Pause the video and think about it before I give you the answer. Hopefully you came to the conclusion that as long as there's variation in the x data, as long as the variance of x is non-zero, you will always obtain a solution for the least squares model. As long as there's variability away from the mean, then you can always calculate b1. To end of this video, let's go through a practice problem. Calculate the least squares estimates for b0 and b1 using the two formulas you've just learnt. Here are some raw data and I've calculated some summary numbers from them to help you out. Did you get the answers shown here on the screen? If not, make sure that you can confirm them.